on the wireless, I drag. Yeah. Yeah, that usually. Well, now is a good test time as ever to move the uh, piano back up front. Well, hold on. <laughs> are we back on? All right. We are live. Okay. Okay. Stay where you are. Well, um, technical difficulties, so just uh, bear with us. Uh, you know how life is right now. But uh, bear with us. Stay with us. Don't leave. If you are not, we're knocked off, just hold on and we'll figure out a way to get back on. Will you all play for us again another song? Thank you. Sure. Do the next one? Yep. Uh, let's do Jesus It seems as though we're having a Sunday to match our week, <laughs> but we're, we are back on. We believe we'll, we'll stay on this time. We are having difficulty with the internet here at the church. But um, with everything going on, now more than ever is a time to center ourselves and, and to pray. So let's take a moment to pray. Almighty God, we confess our need of you we take so much of our lives for granted. But in the end, we cannot rely on our own strength. We need you and we need one another. We have enjoyed the blessings of self-reliance, but in the end, we know we need community. We need one another to do what is right and good. We need one another to stay out of trouble, to remind us to be kind and charitable in difficulties. We need one another and you to improve our minds and to keep our hearts clean. We need you and one another if we are to grow in wisdom and understanding. Good and gracious God, we need you. To heal our sacred creation that is scarred. And to recover from fires that have ravaged our community. Wise and gracious God, we need you and one another. for patience and knowledge as we try to educate our children in a time of pandemic. Help us with innovation and patience. Healer and Redeemer, we need one another to do the work that you have set before us, to feed the hungry, to house the displaced, to clothe the poor, Heal the broken. We cannot do these things alone. Help each of us find our usefulness and our place in the work of your peaceable kingdom. Good and gracious God, we pray for our community ravaged by fire. We pray for those who struggle to breathe We pray for those without homes or separated from family. We pray for those who have so much to do that they don't know what to do next. Be present in our circle of care for all we love who suffer of body, mind, or spirit. For any who mourn this day the loss of a friend or loved one, especially be with 
Barry and Kim in the loss of Barry's mom, Bonnie. Be with new parents in this time, babies born and the hope of new life. Be with new families as they venture out into a new chapter. And good God, we pray for this church, which is your church. Guide our lives individually and as a body. Put us to doing what you would have us to do. Put us to loving who you would have us to love. That we would not only speak the gospel message, but be that message, to be good news. And will you lead us in a Lord, the Lord's Prayer? I will, but I just want to add, I know you pray generally, but Barbara also said, uh, pray for all my dear friends that lost their homes in Phoenix in talent. Okay, so. right. We'll have a time. We're going to close the service um, where we're going to take time and just take your messages. Um, James and I will read them. And uh, we'll also light candles if you'd like. So um, if you're not able to get them in now, and if we don't say them now, we'll, we'll really take that time. Yeah. That's one reason, well, that's one of the primary reasons why we wanted to go to Facebook Live so that we could actually have some interaction, interaction this morning. And it sounds like we're, we're on for good, right? We're, we're here, so uh, <laughs> we just had a little rough going. Kind of yeah. wouldn't have made any sense if we didn't on this morning. <laughs> okay. All right. And so let's join together in prayer. Um, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, hallowed be, be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this time I think um, Zach and James are really going to have you on and people will be able to really worship with you. <laughs> that's, that's Jeff. Zach and Jeff. Jack, Zach and Jeff. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Zach and Jeff. Very good. Do we want to give them a mic?
For centuries, people in times of trouble and crisis have turned to the Psalms. And so we're going to do that this morning. And uh, James and I are going to be reading from Psalm 46. Go ahead. God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city, which shall not be moved. God will help it at the dawn of day. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, God's voice resounds, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord who has wrought desolation in the earth. Who makes wars cease to the ends of the earth, breaks the bow, shatters the spear, and burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord, Lord of hosts, hosts is, is with, with us. The, the God, God of Jacob, Jacob is our refuge. First Methodist in Medford continues to be in ministry with this community and with the congregation, finding ways to reach out to those who are in crisis. And we appreciate your generosity through the years, your commitment to a pledge, if you made one, that we would continue, um, that we would flourish when, when most needed. So once again, thank you for your offerings. You can um, give through the website if you'd like. You can drop it by uh, and say hello to, to all of us on the staff, or you know, just do the old fashioned snail mail. But uh, once again, we thank you. I thank you for your, your generosity. And uh, James is going to read our scripture to us. We're beginning a, a six week um, series on the book of Acts. I mean, excuse <laughs> me, which the book of um, Exodus. Exodus. About uh, yes. God's freedom, liberating his people, and what that looks like. So I'm reading this morning from Exodus chapter 12, and I'll read the first 14 verses. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor to, in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided into portion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your saddle, sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. Not the easiest passage to read, James, but I appreciate it. 
<laughs> and you're wondering, what are we going to do with that passage? Well, hold on here. Um, let me repeat a passage, a line from that. This day shall be remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord throughout your generation. It is a festival to the Lord. Let us take a moment to pray. May the words of my heart, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts, wherever folks are listening and whatever time they listen, uh, be acceptable to you. Amen. It has been quite a week. It's been a tragic week uh, for, for many. As I speak, the smoke hangs heavy in the air and fires, well, they burn. We've, we've been on national news uh, throughout the week because of our situation. And our, our prayers go out to those who have lost their homes and businesses, for those who are uh, sleeping in hotel rooms or, well, with friends. And uh, while we also pray, we each want to find our way to help. And, and that's not always easy, trying to figure out how, how you fit in, how you can make a difference. Well, as I was saying, our church is on standby for those who have lost their home or house and need shelter. But um, here we are. Uh, the Red Cross has really stepped in in the area, providing hundreds of hotel rooms. But in time, I'm told by the city of Medford and Jackson County, um, we still may get called upon, so we're here. I think of so many of us who have children that are not able to go to school and now um, not able to, to go outside and the struggle, the struggle parents are, are having. Um, of older folks who I've noticed have spent a lot of time alone. Uh, watching video footage of the fire, the damage appears to be so random. Some houses and neighborhoods are ravaged and others are spared. I'm, I'm more accustomed to tornadoes and, well, that's how a tornado works. And, uh, mm -hmm. well, it's, it's, in that way, it's similar. It's, to some extent, we are all living into the trauma, the smoke and the dread. It's been a difficult year. I, I don't imagine that many of us, anybody here wants to repeat 2020 in many ways, right? The pandemic, the loss of income for so many was um, being suffered before the fires ever began. The politics of this country have divided us, and there's a good many of us uh, who fear um, our democracy being frayed at the edges. But know that we're not the first to experience these things, and we won't be the last to live in crisis. Our parents and grandparents could tell us plenty of stories of natural disaster pandemics, economic depressions, political turmoil, and, well, even war, which, um, well, even war. Each generation, generation is asked in these moments, so, so where is this God who loves us? Where, where do you find God? The ancient story uh, we read this morning gives us glimpses. The Exodus story has provided the oppressed, the downtrodden, the weary with guidance and um, inspiration for centuries, for centuries. And through the weeks, I'd like to talk about what that freedom looks like. And for this morning, um, what we can find in that, well, what could have been a dry passage, but James did a good job with it. Our passage this morning begins with a sentence, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall mark for you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year. Uh, this thing that he's talking about that begins the year is a Passover. It's one of the high holy days of the Jewish people. It begins their calendar year. So it's quite interesting that what begins their calendar year is their moment, their greatest moment of crisis. And when they are about to be liberated, uh, the people are about to be freed. And that's when their community begins at this tense moment. Their, their lives, their calendar, the way they tell time, the way they will number their months and days begins when God works on their behalf. And that's how they designate their future. It's the month of Nisan is when this takes place. The Jewish people keep time from that first Passover. And everything, everything in the Old Testament especially, is referred back to that beginning when... Um, they won their freedom and they passed through the Red Sea on dry land and they began that very long journey to the promise. 
So each year, uh, Jewish families and communities celebrate the Passover, or what was commonly, is commonly called the Seder. And they remember the story as they eat, and every dish on that table when they gather is in some way a reminder of a chapter in that liberation. The horeset is um, a dish of apples and nuts and wine, and it represents the mortar um, of the Hebrew slaves. It's like a, like a, like a, a relish. Uh, the the uh, matzah crackers are the unleavened bread and symbolize the urgency of the moment where they didn't have time to let the bread rise. They eat bitter herbs as a reminder of the bitterness of slavery. The roasted lamb, well, that of course commemorates the lamb sacrificed the night the Jews fled. And all the other dishes that we won't get into are similar. Uh, the word that comes to mind is actually um, has a Greek history, is anamnesis. And anamnesis is kind of like memory. It's not a, a word that's uh, easy to translate into English, but it's more than history. It's to relive the past and particular way. It's a way of bringing the past into the present. And that's what they do at the Passover. They reenact the liberation to know that they are always being liberated from some pharaoh of some sort manifesting itself in some way and to cherish their freedom. So that, that Passover, that memory, that anamnesis becomes their touchstone to go back and to relive and to keep the faith that that Passover happens each year, that liberation continues. And so the question is, is what is our touchstone in times of struggle? It's really a question worth finding an answer. When has God delivered you? What is your anamnesis? What can you go back to? When has God delivered us up? In the Christian tradition, of course, it's the resurrection. We point to the cross as the worst moment for God, but also and for his for God's people, but also well, the best. Where God is put on the cross, suffering for a broken world, only to break the very evil chains that put him there. And you have resurrection. So we look to the cross. But we also look to those more personal moments in our lives when God has delivered us. When has God delivered you? When has God remained steadfast? Try to answer that question in the coming week. When has God delivered you? And go back to that, bring it into the present, and use it as your source of strength. What are your stories? What's your touchstone? Where does your assurance come from? I uh, have been going back to a hymn of, of Charles Wesley and uh, the, the a, a lyrics uh, that um, I know from years past. And are we yet alive and see each other's face? Glory and thanks to Jesus give for his almighty grace. What troubles have we seen? What mighty conflicts past? Fightings without and fears within since we assembled last. Yet of all, the Lord hath brought us by God's love, and still God does help afford and hides our life above. And are we yet alive? We are indeed. The second lesson I find in this passage is in that times of crisis, we need to remember to care for ourselves and one another. We see this in God's command for each household to take an unblemished lamb and roast it for a meal. And if you're a household that's too small for your own lamb, then it says go to your nearest neighbor and share that lamb with them. And I like this line, this verse. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. In other words, everybody is invited to the table to get something to eat and something good, a roasted lamb, which really was, you know, an honor to eat in that time. They didn't eat many roasted lambs, especially if you were a slave. It was quite a meal to have. Eat it then in that moment of crisis. Now, there, there's more to this lamb and, than just a good meal. There's also the blood of the lamb, and that kind of turns us off blood. But remember, blood has always been a source of life. 
I mean, many of us have had transfusions. I've had a transfusion in an accident or disease. Some of us has trans transfusions and surgery. And that blood is that sign of life. So they put that blood on the doorpost so that the angel of death passes over them. It's a sign of life. But most important for our message today is to remember the Hebrew people took time to gather and be fed when they were in a time of crisis. They're not told to boil the lamb. That would have been faster. <laughs> and they're told certainly not to eat it raw. Do it right. Do it tasty. Do it delicious. Do it roasted. Yeah, do it roasted. And remember the context. This is a time of war. And finally, after 10 plagues, the Hebrew people have a moment when the Pharaoh is feeling weak. And they know that this angry Pharaoh, well, his weakness isn't going to last long. His vulnerability is only for a moment. It's time to pack their bags and get out. But first, what of all things are they told to do? They're told to eat roast, to eat a lamb. Find a perfect lamb, gather together and eat. Listen again to the lines from the story. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hands, and you shall eat it hurriedly. In other words, there's work to do. We've got to get out. Time is running short. The liberation is at hand. But first, eat. I have a chef friend and a uh, uh, food stylist who knows all about food. And what he says in time of trouble, make a sauce. Sauce, yeah. you know, adds flavor. Make a sauce. I kind of get that. Make a sauce. I mean, it's not the time to make a three-layer cake. But people must be fed. Roast a lamb, and then the passage says, add some herbs, bring out the flavor. I saw a photo this past week on Facebook of firefighters, exhausted firefighters, napping in a green field they found. The fire rages, but they needed a green field to lay down and take a nap. That's right. Whatever troubles you have before you, whatever problems you must tackle, find that green field, find that roast. In other words, get enough sleep. Take a moment to sit at the table to eat. Spend a few moments each day to calm your spirit. Feed your soul. Take care of yourself. Roast a lamb and eat it. And finally, Keep in mind what this story and so many stories in the Bible say about the character of God. I was listening to an interview this morning with Alan Alda, who was describing the difference between compassion and empathy. Compassion, he says, is feeling sorry for someone, but empathy is getting a reading, getting a reading of what another person's going through, of what that other person is suffering, and then, well, acting on it. We learn from our Bible, in this story in particular, that this God we worship has empathy. God hears the Hebrew prayers and our prayers. It may seem as though God has taken an awfully long time to respond. But God, throughout Scripture, is always on the side of the suffering, every single time. Listen to how this whole Exodus book begins. The Hebrew people feel forgotten. And the story begins with this line. Now a king arose in Egypt who did not know Joseph. It's important. Joseph, of course, was a patriarch that brought his family, the Hebrew people, to Egypt generations earlier during a time of famine so they could have something to eat and they settled there and life was rosy for them. But not anymore. Now these people are slaves in a brickyard. And with a pharaoh who is commanding midwives to kill their Hebrew baby boys, they feel they have no future. And they certainly feel forgotten. Yeah, we can. But remember, God comes through. Remember that touchstone to go back to that, the anamnesis. Even before the fires, many of us were struggling with pandemic. Like I was saying, children unable to go to school. I, I raise teenagers. I know how they need to be social, to connect with each other, and to have to sit at home all day with your parents. That's really a crime. <laughs> it's hard on us, too, as parents. I know. It's I mean. got to be tough on the parents. <laughs> it's got to be tough, especially when 
moms and dads and grandparents, they've got to get out and work, or uncles and aunts. We're on edge, we get tired and cranky, we have arguments with those we love right now. Yeah, we, we're short on patience. But God has not forgotten us and sees our predicament. And knowing that the God has not forgotten us keeps our hope alive. And we will get to the other side. God is empathic. That's the underlying story of the Bible. So I want to close with a passage from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus is giving his inaugural address. In other words, he's gone to his home synagogue and he's giving his first sermon. He's been baptized. His ministry is about to take off. And he, he, will, he, he gives the message one Sunday morning to his community. And I want to read to you what he talks about, about what he is going to be about, what Jesus is going to be about, and what, well, all the men and women were about after him who followed him. So I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. This is what I want us to hear. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. That's our Lord, and that's the church. Amen. Amen. So do we have met people messaging us? I hope so. We do not, and okay. we are exactly 45.4 seconds delayed on the live feed. I <laughs> timed it while we were serving, <laughs> while you were preaching. Uh, we had uh, Barbara Geisler mentioned, I mentioned earlier, she did say that uh, remembering dear friends who've lost homes in Phoenix and talent, and this has touched this congregation. Right. Um, I was for a while at the Talent Church, and there are there are people at the Talent Church who've lost their homes, and okay. actually there there are people who have relocated to Klamath Falls, where you are now, where I am now, and um, so it is something that it has touched us. And I have filibustered enough. Sarah said, "Happy birthday to Kat." Who's, it's her birthday today, and Barbara said, "Happy Grandparents Day." It's hap- it's a Grandparents Day. So. Oh, okay. Well, I can actually celebrate that this year. <laughs> there Very you go. Good. Very good. <laughs> so, uh, but th- th- we don't um, we don't have any. Oh, here, um, Mary also mentions that some have lost pets as well. Uh, I know my wife has mentioned there's some awful pictures of lost pets, and uh, okay. I d- have not looked at them. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, but it's that's a, a tough thing. Yeah, it's very hard. Yeah, yeah. Well, then let's um, uh, close with some music, and then I'll have a blessing. Thanks, guys.
Jeff and Zach, that was wonderful. Thank you. Go now in peace and know that the peace of God is with us. Jesus walks beside us and the Holy Spirit is within us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Bye-bye.